Numbers chapter 12. Did I say Exodus or Numbers? Numbers. Know what I think instead of what I say. It is good to be here, good to be saved. Let's think about the songs that we sing. He leadeth me. I got thinking about that. I got thinking that uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if if the Lord just come down, take you by the hand, and walk you around, and talk to you, and tell you what you need to do, and strengthen your faith, and all this stuff? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing if, if that would happen? One of these days, it's going to happen. Amen. And uh, we get to be with the Lord, and, and He'll take us by the hand, and walk us through, walk us through heaven. That'd be a wonderful thing. And then, then we sing that song. Uh, what was that last one we sang? Can it be? No, and can it be? Uh, two great songs, and God is good. And those songs are written under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, most of them. Most of the songs we sing are written back in the 17s and 1800s. And these folks didn't have televisions. They didn't have internets and all that stuff. And they could, uh, they could uh, have a, a close walk with God without interruption. Of course, they had their troubles just like we all do, but they could have a close walk with God. And because of that, you have these wonderful songs that we sing that mean so much. And it's such a blessing. And uh, I'm thankful for those songs. and uh, They're good. Now, we're going to start in Numbers chapter 12. We're going to start reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. And the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses, and unto Aaron, and unto Miriam, Come out, ye three, into the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of a cloud, and stood in the door of the tabernacle, and called Aaron and Miriam, for they both came forth, and they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, or speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore, then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. Now that's the Lord. The Lord got angry with Miriam and Aaron, and he just left. And a cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow, and Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is consumed, is half consumed, when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days, and after that let her be received in again. And Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days, and the people journeying not till Miriam was brought in again. All this happened, a couple of things here before I get started in the message, but a couple of things. All this happened is because they spake against God's servant. God is protective of his servants. You need to remember that. God is jealous over his people. And another thing you see here is that Miriam must have been the one doing the talking when she was talking with Aaron. Now they were just talking with themselves. There wasn't anybody else around. And Miriam was griping about Moses. She was complaining. She's jealous. And she said what she said about Moses and God heard it. That reminds me to tell you that these things you say in secret, God hears. 
God hears. Just like he heard these two talking, God hears it. And it angers God. And he brings them to the tabernacle of the congregation. And when he does, he calls Miriam and Aaron forth. And when he does, he said, I heard what you said. He said, if I talk to anybody, he said, I'll talk to him in visions and dreams. But not my servant Moses. He said, I talk to this man face to face. And when Moses talks to me, God says, he talks to a similitude of me. In other words, he didn't see God. He saw a similitude of God. And he said, but I don't do that with anybody else but Moses. I speak to him face to face. And then he kept talking, and you can just see the Lord as he goes there. And the Lord gets angrier and angrier and angrier. And he calls Moses. He says, my servant Moses. He calls him Moses, my servant Moses twice. And he gets so angry, he just leaves. And when he leaves, the cloud goes off the uh, temple, off the tabernacle, and it goes up. And when they look around, here's Miriam, just as white as snow. She's turned a leper. So you know that she's the one doing the talking. When she turns as a leprous, Aaron began to confess his sins. We did wrong. We did foolishly. We sinned. We sinned. Uh, help us. Uh, help us. And Moses turned. He prays to God. I beseech the old God. He said, heal her, heal her now. And God comes down and he says, if her father had spit in her face, you'd at least kick her out of the camp for seven days. So they kicked her out of the camp, and after seven days she was healed. And what I want to bring to your attention is the idea that God calls Moses. He says, my servant Moses. If you remember last week, I preached concerning Moses and his preparation to become the man of God. God calls Moses the man of God, the man of God. But he had to prepare for that duty. He had to prepare for that uh, job that God had given him. He had to prepare to become the man of God. Now here today I want to talk about Moses as God's servant. God's servant. And this will apply to you, Christian, because you are to be a servant of the Lord. God gives Moses that title, my servant Moses, six times. Six times in the word of God. And when one thinks about being a servant, many feelings come to mind, and you probably think about slavery. A lot of people, when you talk about being in servitude, think about slavery. And that's a, that's a bad thing, but it wasn't only America that was involved in slavery. Every nation under the country, under the sun, was involved in slavery in one form or another, or at one time or another. Without getting into any political ideology, slavery, slavery, could be a horrible system, and it was a horrible system, where men and women were treated like animals, and they were bought and sold like animals. They were beat like animals. They were kept like animals. I, to me, the saddest thing about slavery is, what I think about it is having a, a man up on the selling block, and they sell that man away from his family, or they take their kids, and they sell those kids away from the family. That just tears my heart out. That's hard to imagine that People could be so callous and so cruel, but they did. But not all slaves were treated badly. At the end of the Civil War, uh, many slaves refused to leave their foreign masters because their families were treated well, and they loved their foreign masters. That's a biblical thing. The Bible talks about it over there in the book of Exodus in chapter 21, where a slave would serve so many years, and then he would let, be let go, a Hebrew slave, and if he was let go, he had one opportunity. He says, now, you can either go free, but if you go three, free, you're going to have to leave your wife and kids here. He said, but you can go free. But if the servant, the Bible said, if he loved his master, he could put his ear up and let the master drill a hole in his ear. And then he would become that master's servant for the rest of his life. And why did he do it? Because he loved his master. I heard a former president say one time that the Bible uh, preaches is pro-slavery. No, it's not. Slavery is not a God-instituted institution. Slavery is man brought forth. Man brought forth slavery. God just tells a slave how to act under slavery. 
He didn't promote it. It's important to know that God's title for Moses is as a servant. And it's a foremost title. God says, my servant Moses. When he looks at you, can he honestly say about you, my servant Don, my servant Charles, my servant Judy, my servant Angie. Can he say that about you? He said it about Moses and he said it six times. Can I tell you something? That you are a servant. Everybody here is a servant of somebody else's. You're either a servant of God, or you're a servant of man, or you're a servant of sin. But everybody's a servant. You're one of those three. Servant of God, a servant of man, or a servant of sin. What you see about Moses is God calls him my servant Moses. And in heaven, in heaven, Moses is mainly known by that title. What a title that is. And even after he dies and Joshua takes over, God still refers to Moses as my servant Moses. And Moses has been dead. Moses is gone. But God says he's such a good servant that he, he continued to call him my servant Moses. Servitude is, a, is well known in the Word of God. It starts in Genesis chapter 9 and runs through Revelation chapter 22. You and I today as, as Christians are called the servants of Christ. We are the servants of God. Now you can be a servant of sin or a servant of man, but as a Christian you are to be no longer a servant of sin, but a servant of God. Do you serve the Lord? Can you say to me, preacher, I believe I serve God. What does a servant do? He does what his master tells him to do. He's at the beck and call of his master. He's there for his master. He does what his master needs. Are you a good servant? You know, for some reason, God, back in the infinite time of eternity, Somewhere back there, God decided that he was going to save people through his son, Jesus Christ. And he was going to put them in the body that he called the body of Christ. And this body was going to be, this body was going to be a group of believers that serve the Lord. That's why we're put in the body. Some of us are hands, the Bible says. Some of us are ears. Some of us are eyes. Some of us are mouths. Some of us are feet, all these different things, but we all are there for one purpose, and that is to serve the body. Now, brethren, I'll tell you, for the last two weeks, I have been battling. I have, uh, in my foot, got, uh, I hate to use the word, but it's gout. It looks like they could get a better word, gout. But I have had gout in my foot, and I haven't been able to put a shoe on. I haven't been able to walk. And it's been miserable. And it's just one small part of my body. But my, when that thing gave out and it, it got all red and feverish and all this and swelled up and all that stuff, I couldn't walk. And I tell you that when you lose your feet, even your toes, the whole body is affected. My foot has served me faithfully for 65 years. Now, from time to time, it got infected and troubled, but it's been a good foot, been a good servant to the body. So I can tell you, I know what it is when part of the body does not perform its job. And as a Christian, you have a job. Now, listen to me now. This is important. There's not anybody in here that names the name of Christ that is not a servant and you have a job to do in the body are you doing it that's the question are you performing are you performing as we has been said god's most used title about moses was my servant moses now you got to look at Moses and consider what made him a good servant. The first thing I want to tell you is this. He was obedient. Moses was an obedient servant. 
It's required in a servant to be obedient. Now, the Bible said in Exodus 7, verse 20, He said, And Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded. He was obedient. When God tell, told him to do something, he did it. That's one of the reasons God said, My servant Moses, because Moses was an obedient servant. As a servant, he did what he was told. He gave the law to Israel. He led Israel. He struck the rock that Israel might drink water. He built the tabernacle, on and on and on. He did what God told him to do. For 40 years, Moses did exactly what God told him to do. And he didn't vary. 14 times in Exodus, we find the phrase, as the Lord commanded Moses. In other words, Moses did what God told him to do. And you as a servant, you're to do what God tells you to do. You say, well, I never hear God tell me anything. Are you ever in the book? Do you ever read the Bible? Do you ever come to church and hear the preaching? God speaks through His Word. God speaks through His men. God, God has a preacher up here to preach to you so that He can speak to you through me. I'm given to you by God. The Bible calls it a gift over there in Ephesians. And God has given the church gifts and He calls them preachers. And why does he have a preacher preach? So that he can speak to his people through the preacher. Now, I don't know anything about all that. I just preach what I believe God wants me to preach, and, and I hope it ministers to people. That's what God does. And Moses, as a servant, he did the work his master instructed him to do, and he did it just like God told him to do it. Exodus chapter 25 and 40, the Bible says, and look, God talking to Moses, he said, and look thou, uh, and look that thou make them after the pattern which was shown thee in the mount. God says, you make sure you make this stuff just like I showed you up on the mountain. God showed him what he wanted done up on the mountain. He came down and did it. And he did it just like God told him to do. Exodus 26, 30. The Lord talking to Moses again, he said, Thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof, which was shown thee in the mount. He said, Remember, I showed you how I wanted it done. Now you do it down here. And Moses did it. Exodus 27, 8, he said, Hollow with boards shalt thou make it. As it was showed thee in the mount, so shalt thou make it. So everything God told Moses about the tabernacle that he wanted Moses to build, he showed him while Moses was 40 days up on the, on the mountain, and then Moses came down and God reminded him, he said, you make sure that you do it just like I showed you while you were up on the mountain. And Moses came down and he did it just like God wanted him to do it. Now, if you're going to be a good servant, you got to understand, you got to be obedient. You got to do what God tells you to do. And God tells you what to do over and over again beside the basic things, the basic things such as prayer, the basic things such as going to church. Oh, how people look at that as just a, a passing thing. Oh, you know, I don't have to do that. Oh, yes, you do. That's part of being a good servant. Going to church, that's part of being a good servant. And if you don't go to church and you lay out a church, you are not being a good servant. Oh, people don't like to hear that, but it's the truth. I didn't set the church up. No other preacher you know set the church up. God set the church up. And God said, I want you to go to church on Sunday. That's what God said. And I want you to hear preaching. I want you to sing. I want you to take up an offering. God said all that. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. You don't have to go there now, but I'm just telling you. You want to find it out, go there. As a servant, Jesus Christ was just like Moses. Moses. The Bible said in John 5, 30, he said, uh, the Lord said, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. The Lord Jesus said, I'm doing what my Father told me to do. And the Lord Jesus Christ was his servant. He was his servant. As servants, you and I should be obedient. There's a story in uh, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith's autobiology called In Our Times. And it illustrates the, the devotion 
of Emily Gloria Wilson, who was his family's housekeeper. One day, John came in and he said to his housekeeper, he said, he said, I need to rest. He said, I'm going in. I'm going to lay down on the bed for three or four hours. He said, I do not want to be disturbed. So he goes in and he lays down, and in a couple of hours, the phone rings. And Emily, the housekeeper, picks it up, and she answers it. And on the other line was President Lyndon Johnson. And Lyndon Johnson said, uh, this is President Johnson, said, I need to talk with John Galbraith. And I need to talk to him now. Would you put him on the phone? She says, uh, no, sir, I can't do that. He said, this is the President of the United States. I need to talk with John. Put him on the phone. She said, I cannot do that. She said, he said, why can't you do that? She said, because he's sleeping, Mr. President, and he said not to disturb him. He said, well, wake him up. I want to talk to him. And she said on the phone, she said, Mr. President, I don't work for you. I work for Mr. Galbraith. And after that conversation, the next time President Johnson saw Galbraith, he said to him, he said, I want you to tell that woman that I want her to come work for me in the White House. That's pretty good. That's a good servant. You know what she did? She did what her master told her to do, not what somebody else told her to do. She was her master's servant. And she did what God, what she, what her master told her to do. And you and I should do what God tells us to do. And nobody else. Nobody else. We are his servants. Moses was obedient. Are you obedient? I'll tell you something else about Moses. He had the right attitude. Everybody's got attitude. You know that? Everybody's got an attitude. Maybe a good attitude, maybe a bad attitude, but everybody's got one. What kind of attitude do you have when it comes to the Lord? I'll tell you what kind of attitude most of us have. The Bible says, because I can't quote it. But anyway, God says because we don't, because God doesn't send judgment on us every time we do something wrong, that we think we got by with it, and therefore we do more wrong. And that's not right. He said because, ex because judgment is not executed on a, a work speedily, he said therefore the hearts of the sons of men are fully set in them to do evil. Because God doesn't drop the hammer on us, we think we can get by. Because you lay out a church, you think you can get by. Because God doesn't drop the hammer on you that day. You think you can not do what God tells you and nothing happens to you, so you think you got by, so that leads to more disobedience. That's a bad attitude. You know what Moses did when God first called Moses? Moses gave him a litany of excuses. One excuse after another. He says to the Lord, Who am I that you would send me? And by the way, who are you? He was talking to a burning bush. Moses says, Who am I that you would want me to go deliver the children of Israel? And by the way, who are you? Then he says, If you send me, they won't believe me. Then he says, After the Lord answered that, then he says, I'm not eloquent of speech. I don't talk well. And then God answered that. He said, who made your mouth? And then he finally just says, won't you please send somebody else? I just don't want to go. And God answered that. So he had his excuses to start out with. But Moses, as a man and as a servant, was a meek man. Did you read that passage there where we were at in Exodus chapter 12? Look at verse 3. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Now to be a meek man doesn't mean you're a weak man. To be a meek man means you're mild of temper, you're soft, you're gentle, you're not easily provoked or irritated, uh, you're yielding, you're humble, and you're submissive to the divine will, you're not proud or self-sufficient, uh, you're, you're just a mild mannered fellow, humble fellow. And the Bible said Moses was meek 
above everybody else on the face of the earth. The meekest man upon the face of the earth. That was Moses. And as a servant, when it comes to serving God, you should be meek. You should be meek. Jesus Christ was meek. He said in Matthew 11, verse 28, He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden's light. The Lord says, I'm meek. And He is meek. The Lord doesn't put the hammer on us when we do wrong. He doesn't chastise us every time we mess up. He's meek. And as a servant, you and I should be meek. We should have the right attitude. When it comes to God, He ought to be primary. He ought to be first. That's what's wrong with Christians today. We don't put God first. Amen. Right. That's the bottom line of everything. We do not prioritize correctly. We don't put God first. We should always put the Lord first. Being a servant doesn't necessarily mean having a low position. It means having a lowly heart. One time a fellow went to a restaurant and the waitress came up to him and she said, my name is Grumpy. She said, my name is Grumpy and I'll be your waitress today if you need something. Uh, you'll just have to wait your turn and don't push me. That woman didn't have a servant's heart. She shouldn't have been a waitress. Moses was a good servant. Most expect good servants, but aren't good. Most expect good service, but most people aren't good servants themselves. One time, a great violinist, Nic Niccolo Paganini, he was a great violin player, and he willed his marvelous violin to the city of Genoa, Switzerland on the condition that it could never be played. Well, the wood of such an, infant, uh, an instrument, uh, by being used and handled, it only wore slightly, but they took this violin, and you can understand why they did it, they took this violin and his request was that it never be played after he gave it to them. So they take this wonderful piece of instrument and they take it and they put it in a box. They put it in a glass box. And over the years, with the violin never being touched, never being played, it began to rot and disintegrate to where it finally got to where it was worth absolutely nothing. Worth nothing. It became a, a worm-eaten, useless, useless relic. And a Christian's unwillingness to serve may, may destroy your ability to be useful. Did you hear what I said? Your unwillingness to be used now could be one day put into the category where you are useless for anything when it comes to God. You don't want to allow, you don't want to allow yourself to just be set in a corner and just mold away. You want to be used you want to be played. You want to be a good servant. Then the last thing I want to say is Moses was faithful. The Bible said in Hebrews 3, 5, he says, And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken hereafter. You know what Moses was? He was faithful. He was faithful. As a servant to his God, he was faithful to his master, for his master was faithful to him. And as a servant for his master's people, he intercedes for God's people five times when God got angry with Israel. Five times, the Bible says, Moses fell on his face and begged God not to destroy him. He was, he was Israel's leader. They were his people. He wanted the best for them. Once he even said, God, he said, Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sins, and if not, blot, blot me, I pray thee, out of the book which thou hast written. 
Moses loved those people so much that he said, God, if you won't forgive their sins, then he just quit. And he says, God, if you won't forgive their sins, then just blot me out of the book that you've written. If you're going to destroy them, destroy me too, Lord. I couldn't live. That's faithful. That's faithful. I've always wanted to be faithful with the church that God gave me. I've always wanted to be faithful. And I hope I have been. But I always wanted to do the best I could. I always tried to be here when I was supposed to be here. I've always tried to give you something that will help you. I want to be faithful. I want to be a faithful servant. And, and you need to be a faithful servant. And God looks at you and he can know that if he asks you to do something, you'll do it. And you'll do it right. As a servant, Jesus Christ was faithful. The Bible said in Revelation 1, 5, he said, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The Lord was a faithful servant, a faithful witness. And we as servants, we should be faithful. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1 and 2, he said, Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and the stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. If you're going to be a good servant of God, it is essential that you be faithful to God. Are you going to do everything right every time? No. Did Moses do right every time? No. But God called him my servant Moses because he was obedient and he was faithful. He had the right attitude. In 1972, NASA launched an exploratory space probe called Pioneer 10. And according to a uh, 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 engineer of the time, he said the sa satellite's primary mission was to reach Jupiter and photograph the planet and its moons and beam, beam the data back to, to, uh, uh, back to Earth. Scientists regarded this as a bold plan for at the time no Earth satellite had ever gone beyond Mars and they feared the asteroid belt would destroy the satellite before it could reach its target. Well, Pioneer 10 accomplished its mission and a lot more. It swung past the giant planet Jupiter on November of 1973, and Jupiter's immense gravity hurled the Pioneer 10 uh, toward the sun, or, or away from the sun, at a high rate of speed toward the edge of the solar system. One, at one billion mile, one billion, at one billion miles, at one billion miles from the sun, Pioneer 10 passed Saturn, and at 2 billion miles, it hurled past Uranus. And Neptune at nearly 3 billion miles. And finally, it went past Pluto, which is 4 billion miles from the sun. And by 1997, 25 years after its launch, Pioneer 10 was still going out through the universe more than 6 billion miles away from the Earth. What did it run on? It ran on a battery that was big enough to have a night light in your bedroom. And that thing just kept on doing its job. It just kept on doing its job. It was a little small thing. It wasn't supposed to go very far as, as, as distance in outer space goes. But that thing is still going as far as we know. And it went out of the, our solar system here a couple of years ago. You say, why do you tell us that, preacher? Because when we are offer ourselves to serve the Lord, God can work through eight watt abilities. You don't need to be some intellectual giant. You don't need to be some spiritual master. You just need to be willing to do what God wants you to do. You need to be willing to be obedient, willing to have the right attitude, and willing to be faithful. And God can use you. You want to be a good servant? That's what it takes. Moses, my servant Moses.
Moses said to God one time when God was taking them up, bringing them out of Egypt, he was, God was telling Moses all that he was going to do. Moses finally, at the end, when God quit talking, Moses looked up to God and he said, God, if you don't go with us, then don't carry us up. Don't send us. Or if you're not going to go with us, don't send us. And that should be us. Lord, we want to serve you. We want to be faithful. We want to be obedient. We want to have the right attitude. But God, go with us. And we'll endeavor to be good servants. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you for the time this morning.